Hello, welcome to the Research and Disinformation series. These videos were made possible by a partnership between the library and the rhetoric department at the University of Iowa. My name is Chris Way, and all my work on the series has been in collaboration with Tim Arnold and Katie Hassman. Today, we're going to demonstrate a practical application of the concepts that we've covered so far. What you're about to see is four different demonstrations, each showing you how to do lateral reading. We wanted to show a variety of examples because, of course, in your own research, you're likely to run into a variety of types of sources. So we hope this video will give you an idea of how to respond in several different situations. Consequently, this episode will be quite a bit longer than the previous ones. That being said, without further ado, here is Tim Arnold with example number one. Today, we're going to be doing some lateral reading on a source that I discovered on the open internet about restoring hearing using uh, new hair cells. So I'm going to share my screen with you so we can investigate this source together. So right off the bat, I'm kind of like, I'm a little skeptical of this source, I have to say. Hearing restored with new hair cells. I mean, just the title alone sounds a little clickbaity. Sounds like the kind of story that you would see at the bottom of a web website, you know, prefaced by, you know, a statement like, you'll never believe we can restore hearing with new hair cells. So I'm not sure about this source. I'm going to start off with being skeptical, which is generally fine. I think it's generally good to start off in a place of skepticism. But I'm not going to judge the source by just looking at it, right? Because I'm a lateral reader. So I'm going to open a new browser tab, which I've already done here. And then I'm going to decide what um, keywords I'm going to use in my searches. Now, remember, there's four different ways we can uh, search. Uh, uh, we can investigate a source using lateral reading techniques. We can search for the name of the publication. Now, in this case, the name of the publication, which is at the top left here, is called Nature. And that's a very, very general kind of word. And if I do a search for nature, I'm not sure that I'm going to get search results that direct me to information about this particular source, right? It could just be about, you know, the source, the, the search results could just be about the subject of nature itself. So I don't think that's going to be super useful for me. So instead, what I'm going to do is scroll down to the bottom here to see the funding organization, to find who owns this publication. And I can see it's Springer Nature. So I think that's gonna be a little bit better. So what I'm gonna do is search for Springer Nature, and I'm going to include double quotes around the terms Springer and Nature. And what that does is it tells the search engine that you're looking for this exact phrase. I only want search results that include the term Springer Nature. I'm gonna hit enter. Now I see that they have a website here. Remember when we read laterally, we're not looking for um, uh, uh, the original source. We're looking for what other sources say about the credibility of our original source. So I do see they have a Wikipedia page. So I'll start there. It's always fine to start with Wikipedia when you read laterally. In fact, in fact that's probably the best way to start. So what does Wikipedia have to say about Springer Nature? Uh, it's a German-American academic publishing company created in a May 2015 merger between these two publishing houses. Okay, fair enough. Let's look at the history. The company origi originates from a number of journals and publishing houses, notably Springer Verlag, which was founded in 1842. These other publishing companies that were founded in the 1800s. So, okay, these publishing companies have been around for a really, really long time. So, you know, that tells me that um, they have a, a very, very well-established reputation. And I can see here that uh, uh, this is the publication that I was looking at, Nature. So I'm going to, cl I'm going to click Nature because this Wikipedia article is, is going to refer specifically to this publication. So Nature is British weekly scientific journal founded and based in London, England as a multi multidisciplinary publication, Nature features peer-reviewed research from a variety of academic disciplines. Now peer-reviewed, so that's super important. Remember when we uh, talked in our um, video about expertise, when Chris was talking about expertise uh, in video four, uh, we discussed peer review and, and why it's really important, um, how it helps ensure the accuracy of uh, information and also how it helps mitigate bias. So that is a really good indication to me 
that this source is actually pretty good. I mean, this is peer reviewed research. Okay, but I'm not going to just trust Wikipedia. Uh, I'm gonna keep going and look for more people. Um, okay, so I have Springer Nature's reply and fake review. Springer Nature Publon. Springer Nature is the world's largest academic a book publisher published the world's most influential journals a pioneer in the field of open research. So I know what Publons is because I'm a librarian. You may not know what Publons is, but I know that Publons is a really, really trustworthy source. Um, so, okay, that's, that's, I found two sources now that say that Springer Nature is very, very reliable. And something I'd like to point out here is I didn't even have to click this link. You know, I didn't even have to go into this, to, to click into this link to discover uh, that Springer Nature is the world's largest academic publisher. All I had to do was read this little blurb here. So at, most of the time that's actually sufficient. So I can see they have, uh, Springer Nature has a Facebook page. Again, I'm looking for other sources, so I'm not going to click that. I'm going to go to page two and I, I see Bloomberg here. Okay, Bloomberg is a major uh, news publisher. Uh, and they say here, Springer Nature Limited provides publishing services. The company offers academic and scholarly educational fiction and nonfiction. So, okay, I've got three sources, uh, which is sufficient. You know, I could go on and, and look at some more. Springer Nature is committed to supporting the global response to emerging outbreaks. Okay, fair enough. Um, there's really a lot of information that I can find uh, about Springer Nature, and all of it is corroborating to me that Springer Nature is a source that publishes academic, scholarly, peer-reviewed research. So that's all I really need to do. You know, I could do a number of other lateral reading strategies. I could, for example, laterally read the content of this article to see if other sources are reporting uh, that, that this technique actually re does restore hearing. Uh, and that would be fine, but I don't think you have to because I've found my three to five sources that discuss Springer Nature as a source that publishes journals that are peer reviewed and that's sufficient. That's totally sufficient. You don't need to do anything else. Okay, in our second example, we're gonna look at a video from social media. Specifically, I'm gonna show you a video from Facebook and we're going to try to see if we can figure out to what extent this video is trustworthy. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning here. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but it says it's 2016 Democrat primary voter fraud caught on tape. You can look at the title over here on the right. It says it's uh, Democrats busted on camera stuffing ballot boxes. And there's a caption here that um, about only only the only people caught committing voter fraud supposedly are Democrats. And what you'll notice in this video is a collection of various clips of people uh, supposedly in Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Arizona committing uh, voter fraud. And we don't have a lot of other information other than that claim. Um, we don't have any proof of that claim. We just have this decontextualized footage, occasionally with little captions that tell us what we're supposed to be looking at. In this case here, Pennsylvania. Uh, later in the video, you'll see Arizona right here. Um, and then the video ends with this very stark warning in bold red text saying they did it once, they'll do it again. So clearly this is a video that's meant to be um, eliciting a strong reaction from folks. You'll notice it has over 5,000 comments, right? Um, but again, there's not a lot of information in the text itself. We can't vertically read this and get much out of it as far as understanding whether the information is trustworthy. So we need to do our lateral reading. We need to open up other tabs and start looking up things about this video. So what we're gonna do is, um, our first instinct of course should be to look up publication name, organization name, author name, content. Unfortunately with this video, we don't know a lot of those things. We don't know who published it. We don't know what organization is behind this. Um, we don't have an author, right, to refer to. We do have a video and we have the name of this Facebook group that uh, has published a video, Eye on Flix, and we have the content. We have a rough idea of what it is that they're arguing or that they're talking about. So we can start with that. Let's type in Eye on Flix. That's the name again of this Facebook group that posted it. 
We don't know that the video started with them. We just know that they posted it, right? So we'll start with what we have. I on Flix, um, the type of media that it is, in this case, video, right? So we're Googling I on Flix video. Maybe we'll type in I on Flix Facebook video just to indicate, you know, where it came from, right? And maybe we'll search for some keywords about the content. So again, we know what the argument is. We know what the clips are supposed to be representing. We know what the, the caption says. And clearly it's about voter fraud. So let's search for that, voter fraud. So what we're doing is we're looking to see if there are other sources that might comment on this source and might give us some clues as to whether or not we can trust it. Ionflix Facebook video voter fraud. And here's our search results. Um, now, again, the goal of lateral reading is just to find at least three to five sources that are commenting meaningfully on the trustworthiness of your source. So let's open up these first three. This first one looks like it's about fake news. That could be promising. We'll open that up. The second one is an article from CNET. The first one's from Quartz, second one's from CNET. This one also looks like it's about misinformation, right? Uh, and then we have an article from Snopes, which is a well-known fact-checking company. We could open this up. It looks like it's about a video showing Democrats committing voter fraud, which is exactly what we're looking at, right? So let's go ahead and look at the Quartz piece. Um, it's uh, about a Stanford study, apparently, that shows that young US 2020 voters are really bad at spotting fake news. So what is this study about? Is it relevant to our piece? Let's find out. Um, okay, groups of US high school students are shown a grainy video on Facebook in which, here it is, poll workers appear to be stuffing ballots. The video comes from this group, Eye on Flicks claims to show scenes from the 2016 Democratic primaries in Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. And here's the caption. This looks familiar, right? This whole paragraph is very uh, similar. And then the caption is identical to what we just watched. So we know that they're referring to the thing we just watched. And here's their verdict or their information on it. None of it's true. The video is actually showing voter fraud taking place in Russia. Um, now, the point of this article looks to be uh, about how people are misreading the video, um, and it has a link to a experiment about that. So if we were curious, if we wanted to dig a little deeper, we could definitely open up that Stanford study. We could click to read the full report. We could look for a PDF of it, which looks like it's right here. And we could certainly do this. But the purpose of lateral reading is not to give you tons and tons of new stuff to read or hours of content or piles and piles of books and articles. So we don't necessarily have to read this, but we have it in our back pocket if we wanted to know more detail, nuance, context, etc. Uh, but I think it's fair to say what we've learned from Quartz is pretty damning as far as the trustworthiness of this video. So let's move on to our second search result, which was the CNET article. And it says, okay, stay away from Facebook and Twitter when you're talking about learning, when you're talking about misinformation. So let's move on. Again, uh, in the interest of time, maybe we don't want to have to read this whole thing. Uh, maybe we don't have to, maybe we don't want to open up a million tabs and read all the articles because that uh, doesn't make our lives any easier. But we do want to find if this article has something relevant for us. So a trick that I like to do is Control F, or if you're on a Mac, it would be Command F. And you just want to search through this article for relevant words, something like um, Ion Flix, for example. Okay, here we go. Uh, looks like there's a paragraph about our exact video. Uh, in an example, students saw a video on Facebook of poll workers secretly stuffing ballots. The caption says it's from Illinois, Pennsylvania, Arizona. And here's the caption again. Students were asked if it was strong evidence of voter fraud during the 2016 Democratic primaries. A bunch of them thought that it was, but Here's the kicker, right? The video clips actually showed voter fraud in Russia. So again, just, just like what Quartz said, we have the same report coming from CNET. It looks like they're describing the same study from Stanford. So if we wanted again to have more details on that, we could definitely open up this PDF and, and comb through it. But here we have so far two for two. We have two very reputable sources uh, pointing to a third one. And all, all two or three of these are saying that this video is not legit that it seems to be footage from russia now if we wanted to go to our third source uh, this is from snopes this was our third um search result and we googled these these kind of keywords right snopes says 
that there's a video claiming to show Democrats committing voter fraud. The claim is that it depicts Democrats committing fraud during the 2016 primary, and that claim is false. Um, so we can read more about it here, uh, and let's see if it mentions Russia. It does. It looks like the exact same clips were published to YouTube in September 2016 as purported evidence of election fraud in Russia. Okay, so, oh, and we can actually watch the video. There's a link to it here. So again, Find uh, something about lateral reading is it usually opens up a lot of other things that you could read, other things that you could watch, other things you could dig into, and you can open up a million tabs if you really wanted to. But for our purposes, all we really need is a quick look. All we need is this verification from now we have like three or four different sources and they're all saying this video is nonsense. This video is lying. This video is disinformation. It's purporting to be footage from Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Arizona, but it's actually footage from Russia. So now we're going to take a look at information generated by think tanks. And think tanks are basically organizations that conduct research on all different kinds of topics from culture to economics to technology. And the reason they conduct this research is they're trying to inform and influence legislators on what kinds of policies these legislators should adopt. And sometimes their influence goes so far as to actually draft legislation that senators, uh, representatives in the United States House uh, uh, actually put into place as rules and regulations for all of us to follow. So one of the reasons I want to talk about think tanks is because they generate research that is freely and openly available uh, on the internet. And a lot of the research you're going to find, a lot of this free research, this free information, um, is, con is, is developed and created by think tanks. So we're going to take a look at a few of them now. Okay, so this uh, think tank is an organization called the Center for Immigration Studies. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what they have to say about themselves. So they have a description, a self-description here at the bottom. The Center for Immigration Studies is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization founded in 1985. Okay, so they say they're nonpartisan. And basically what this means is that uh, you know, if you are nonpartisan, that means you're an organization that does not have a particular agenda, a particular political agenda. Um, you know, you, you can, it means you conduct objective research that does not have, you know, particular bias or a particular political agenda behind it. Okay, fair enough. It is the nation's only think tank devoted exclusively to research and policy analysis of the economic, social, demographic, fiscal, and other impacts of immigration on the United States. Now, something to note here about this website is that, you know, if we're just, if we're to read this vertically, if we're just to kind of scroll up and down the website and, and evaluate its trustworthiness by just looking at it, I mean, it looks pretty trustworthy to me. And I think it would, and I think it would look trustworthy to most people, especially considering it has a .org address, right? And uh, you've probably been told uh, a number of times that uh, information you get from a .org address is necessarily more trustworthy, more credible, but I'm going to tell you that literally anyone can get a .org address. So just because a website has a .org address, that doesn't say anything at all about its trustworthiness, its credibility. So what we're going to do, we're not vertical readers, remember, we're lateral readers, so we're going to do a search for Center for Immigration Studies and see what information we can find. We're going to read laterally. So I see they have a Wikipedia page here. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say. Center for Immigration Studies is an anti-immigration think tank. Okay, right off the bat, we have a particular, an accusation of having a particular political agenda that, that we did not see here. It doesn't say that they are anti-immigration on their website. So let's see what else they have to say. It favors low, far lower immigration numbers and produces analyses to further these views. CIS was founded by historian Otis Graham and eugenicist and white nationalist John Tannen. So, okay, so we have an accusation, not only have, do they have this political agenda, but they're also created by a white nationalist, which is basically a, a particular kind of hate group that believes in, in white supremacy. Okay, let's see what else they have to say. Reports published by CIS have been disputed by scholars on immigration Fact checkers such as PolitiFact, FactCheck.org, and Snopes. Something to note here about these three organizations is that these are fact checking organizations. So, so here we have another accusation that um, 
the Center for Immigration Studies is also spreading disinformation. Remember, disinformation is factually incorrect information. So not only do they have this hidden um, white nationalist bias, but they're also spreading disinformation. So what else do we have here? Southern Poverty Law Center designated CIS as a hate group. Okay, CIS has said that the designation is false and they filed a lawsuit against the Southern Poverty Law Center, but the lawsuit was dismissed. All right, so that's a lot. Uh, so let's go back to our search results and see if we can find anything that corroborates what we found on Wikipedia. Here we have the Southern Poverty Law Center. CIS and its position within the Tantan Network has been on the Southern Poverty Law Center's radar for years, but precipitated listing CIS as an anti-immigrant hate group for 2016 was its repeated circulation of white nationalists and anti-Semitic writers. Okay, so we found a lot of evidence here uh, uh, stating that the Center for Immigration Studies has this, um, this, this bias that's based in hate. You will find none of that mentioned on their website itself. Okay, so let's take a look at another uh, think tank here. So this is a different think tank. This is the Center for American Progress. Let's see what they have to say about themselves. The Center for American Progress is an independent nonpartisan. Here we have that word again, nonpartisan. They, they claim anyway that they do not have a particular political agenda, that they are not informed by a particular political agenda. Uh, it's dedicated to approving the lives of all Americans. And then they state here as progressives, interesting, we believe America should be a land of boundless opportunity where people can climb the ladder of economic mobility. So we have a little bit of a logical disconnect here. So in, in, up here, they say they're nonpartisan, which means they don't have a political agenda. Here, they say they're progressive and being prog being progressive means you have a particular political ideology. So there's some logical inconsistency here with the way that they represent themselves. But let's see what they have to say. Let's see what other people have to say about this organization. OK, Center for American Progress. That's the Wikipedia page. The public policy research and advocacy organization which presents a liberal viewpoint on economic and social issues as headquarters in Washington, D.C. Work for the Obama and Clinton administrations. These are two liberal presidents. OK, interesting. So they're not nonpartisan, at least according to Wikipedia, but we're going to find some other sources here. Let's see what the nation has to say. Center for American Progress, Washington's leading liberal think tank. It's been a big back of the energy departments. OK, so we have another source stating that they're liberal. Uh, let's see if we can find any others here. Sometimes you have to go to second or third page. Okay, Influence Watch. Center for American Progress is a liberal Washington, D.C. based think tank with strong ties to the Democratic Party establishment. Okay, so we have three sources here which state that the Center for American Progress is not actually nonpartisan, um, nor is it actually be actually progressive. I mean, being liberal and being progressive are two different ideologies. They do share some commonalities, but they're, they're, they're really two different political ideologies. So not only are they not progressive, they're actually not nonpartisan either. So, you know, I don't want to say that the Center for American Progress and the Center for Immigration Studies you know, I don't want to make a false equivalence and say that the kind of misrepresentation that the Center for American Progress is making is the same as the kind of misrepresentation that the Center for Immigration Studies is making. I think it's I think it's fair to say that the Center for Immigration Studies hi hiding and misrepresenting a bias that's based in hate is worse than just misrepresenting your bias. Um, but I think it's still I think if you're misrepresenting yourself, you're misrepresenting your ideology, that still makes you um, untrustworthy to some degree. All right, let's take a, a look at another organization here, the Pew Research Center. Uh, let's see it. This is another think tank. Let's see how they represent themselves. Let's scroll to the bottom here. Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan, there's the word again, fact tank that informs the public about the issues, attitudes, and trends shaping the world. It conducts public opinion polling demographic research, media content analysis, and other empirical social science research. Okay, so we have yet another uh, think tank that's, uh, or to use their words, fact tank, uh, that claims they're nonpartisan. But remember, we're not going to take their word for it. We're going to do our research. 
Center, Pew Research Center. And let's look at Wikipedia. Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan American think tank. Huh, look at that. That's the first time we found a think tank in which uh, the Wikipedia ar article actually agrees with how they estimate themselves. So they say that they are nonpartisan, and Wikipedia also says that they are nonpartisan. Okay, interesting. Let's take a look at some other sources. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Library of Congress, let's see what they have to say about the Pew Research Center. A nonpartisan fact tank that provides information on issues. Okay, nothing negative there. Uh, let's see if we're going here. Pew Research Center media bias rating. So all sides gives uh, Pew Research Center a, a, a center rating, um, which would go along with their claim of being uh, nonpartisan. Pew Research Center is a research institution focusing on questions of public policy and national culture. Nothing here about having any kind of political ideology at all. So it is possible to find um, information from t think tanks that represent themselves accurately, but you're, there's no way for you to do that unless you read them laterally. Okay, so the fourth example and the final example for this video that we're gonna show you is from an opinion piece. Uh, in particular, I'm gonna show you an opinion piece from the New York Times. This is something written by Martin Scorsese. And the title of it is, I said Marvel movies aren't cinema, let me explain. Um, so you'll notice right away that the New York Times labels this as an opinion piece, which is good. That's uh, They're being very transparent about the bias right away, unlike maybe the lack of transparency that we saw in the previous examples. Um, in this case, uh, there's, there's some clarity right away that what you're about to read is an opinion in a certain kind of aesthetic argument. Um, and I won't dwell on this too much, but I do want to give you a brief overview or summary of this argument just so you know what we're looking at um essentially martin scorsese is making two arguments on one hand the aesthetic argument the argument about kind of the philosophy of art um he is saying that there's a meaningful distinction to be made between some kinds of movies and others uh, some of which are going to challenge us and and move us and make us think of the world in a new way and that's what he would call cinema uh, and then he believes that there's other types of films that don't really challenge us meaningfully that don't really push us um, and that are just there to be a spectacle a, a roller coaster ride um, and he puts marvel in that camp which was very controversial um, and so in response to the controversy around comments that he made along these lines he wrote this piece to kind of explain himself so that's one half of the argument and the other half is more about money and the uh, economic kind of state of the business, the state of the film industry and how these big budget blockbusters um, have so much outsized power in the industry and are better able to secure, um, to get distribution and to get on big screens compared to something like an art house film, a foreign film or an independent film, which is something that he bemoans, something that he uh, is, is mourning a bit in this piece. So that's a, a really quick run through of kind of what he's arguing. But our job here is not to analyze the argument itself. We're not doing a vertical reading. We're not doing a close analysis. What we're going to do instead is laterally try to figure out um, how to read this piece, how to contextualize it, how to think through what we would do if we encountered an opinion piece like this and we didn't know much about it. So if we don't know who Martin Scorsese is, for example, maybe that would be a good place to start. We could open up a new tab and then go to Google. And what we'd want to do is just type in his name, Martin Scorsese, and see what we can find out about who is this author. Anytime that I come across an opinion piece uh, by someone whose name I don't recognize, I always want to look up who is this person. Uh, it's really helpful that one of the first results here is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is always going to be great for giving a brief kind of overview of relevant uh, context and information. In this case, it tells us that he's an American film director, he's a producer, a screenwriter, an actor, 
He's a major figure of the new Hollywood era, and he's widely regarded as one of the most significant and influential directors in film history. That's really good to know. That helps us understand that he, in the context at least of talking about film, is someone that's pretty well respected, well regarded, um, and someone who's well informed, right? As someone who has had several decades of a career in filmmaking. And we can read more details about that career if we needed to. Uh, but I think for our purposes, we kind of have what we came here for. So the next thing that we want to do when we come across an opinion piece that we want to know more about, maybe we'll look up the publication name. In this case, it's the New York Times. So I'm going to go to a new tab, I'm going to go to Google, and I'm going to type in the New York Times. Now, I don't want to go to this first result, which is just the New York Times' web page. I don't want to to see their website and how they represent themselves. I mean, we were just at their website, right? What we want is to find some other website, some other source, preferably a, a really reputable source that tells us about the New York Times and uh, helps us get, gives, get some clues about whether we can trust the New York Times. So it's helpful that, um, again, one of the first results here is gonna be Wikipedia. Wikipedia is great for a number of reasons, one of which is it just gives us a very quick overview right away. Um, with a bunch of footnotes so we can check all these sources and we can look at where these claims are coming from. But this overview kind of tells us what the New York Times is if we don't know, right? It's an American daily newspaper based in New York City with a worldwide readership. It was founded all the way back in 1851. That's good to know. It's very well established. It's been around for a long time. It has since won 130 Pulitzer Prizes, the most of any newspaper, and it's long been regarded with the industry as a national newspaper of record. It's ranked 18th in the world by circulation and third in the United States. So just from this paragraph alone, we have a lot of um, kind of we have a good glowing recommendation of The New York Times as a reputable source, as a source that's being pretty honest with us, as a source that's pretty well respected, as a source that's not going to be publishing things uh, for disreputable reasons or for reasons that are meant to disinform us or lie to us right um so there we have just off the bat two sources what we want when we do lateral reading is going to be three to five at least different sources so let's see if we can find a third one now instead of searching for just the name of the author or the name of the publication what i might do for our next search is try to think of some key words or some words that kind of encapsulate what the thesis or what the argument is or what the topic is, right? So in this case, I'm going to type in um, Scorsese, Marvel, movies, aren't cinema. Several words, right? This is this will just give us a, um, this is just a brief encapsulation of what Scorsese's argument was. And I'm going to see if I can find some other sources other than the New York Times that give us other perspectives that are commenting on uh, the opinion piece that we started with. So right off the bat, I get something from Vox. Um, it looks like an explainer piece. Martin Scorsese's fight against Marvel isn't really about Marvel movies. This is a different headline than the one that came up in the search results, which is Martin Scorsese's fight against Marvel movies explained. Uh, but it does look like this is somewhat of an explainer piece. It gives this context. It starts with a little bit of summary of like here's here's what Scorsese is saying in the New York Times piece. Here's what some other people have pushed back with. Um, here is a social media post from James Gunn, who's a, a, a Marvel filmmaker, right? Who obviously would have some opinions about what Scorsese said. Um, and then we have a paragraph here where it's running through a bunch of numbers. It's running through all these figures and this seems to be an analysis or a contextualization of what i earlier called kind of the business side or the economic side of scorsese's argument uh, so vox is trying to not just explain here's what he said here's what other people have said about it but they're also trying to put some of his claims in context and do some of the kind of background homework for us right um and here they're doing more of that we have a bunch of figures uh, we can look at their sources if we want we can look at some of these charts and some of these other statistics that they're citing. Uh, we can look at some of these other quotes, right? Um, but Vox, um, much like Wikipedia, actually, is kind of giving us a corpus of a variety of different types of information that we could then laterally read each of those little snippets if we wanted to. But this is just an example of what you might do if you come across an opinion piece um, that's unfamiliar. 
Um, you don't have to decide whether you're agreeing or disagreeing with the opinion, but when you do lateral reading, what you do want to know is, can I trust this source? Can I trust the person it's coming from? What are other people saying about it? Um, is this an authoritative or trustworthy or um, is this coming from a, a place of expertise uh, or is it not? And in this case, it looks like it is relatively trustworthy. It looks like from what we've found, uh, we can be pretty confident in trusting that Martin Scorsese is not out to disinform us, nor is the New York Times. Again, we might disagree with the conclusions, uh, but we can be fairly confident in saying that this is not disinformation. So hopefully these four uh, examples have been helpful. I know this is a more lengthy video than our other ones, um, but when you do this in your own practice, it's not going to be this long. Um, you can, especially once you get better at it, you can do this in a number of, of seconds. You can do this in less than a minute. You can do this in two minutes maybe. Um, but certainly once you get better and better at it, you'll be much quicker at identifying relevant information, finding the stuff really quickly that you need to know in order to determine whether the thing you're looking at is lying or not. <laughs>